And queen takes f3. Oh, what is going wow. on? Oh, this is going to be a fortress. I just don't see any hopes at all. This is very easy. Just rook back and forth. Taking chess to the next level. Wow. Wow. Wow, yeah. Nothing has to say wow. Creating the future of the sport. Introducing the Champions Chess Tour. 10 months, 10 tournaments. The world's best players online and on TV. So this is the broadcast tool here, ladies and gentlemen, as you can see in all its glory. You can see the notation. You can also see the engine evaluation next to each move and also how long they spend. What I like is you can make your own moves on the board. You can check the alternatives to what the players did. And even for the moves you make, you get the computer evaluation here. Fantastic. Then you get it quicker and better as a premium member, such as yours truly. What I also like, there is a chat function. You can exchange things yeah. with people from all over the world. If you want to see something else, let's say you're watching a tournament and you want to see all the games at once, no problem displaying. I have no idea how many games there are, like 128 games at the same time. You can do even more. This is a team competition. You click on multi-board. That's beautiful. You can see all the eight games going on at once. You can see the games and standings, which I... What we got? I'll click around. Games and standings, here. Yeah. Analysis, if we click on that tab, that's Let's a nice click tool. on it. You can see that it's a great little graphical illustration. The red line is zero, that is the absolute even mark. And if the white bars are go up, the further up they go, the bigger the advantage. And the black bars show a black advantage. Then there is a database, and here we get the alternatives. And we, if we click on a move in the database, bam. Yeah. It gets played on the board. Fantastic. And then the PGN can even be downloaded. I like that feature. Yeah. Whatever tournament or game you're following, you click it and you open it in the program of your choice. Yeah, and one of the great things I like to see as well is when we get a video from the playing hall. I like to see them in their seats, nervous. You feel the tension, you feel like you're there, don't you? Chess is really becoming a spectator's internet sport. Great that we can see that. I also love to see um, the fact that we can get in some of our friends to join us during the broadcast. And it's all interactive, that's what we love. And it's a lot of overview functions there. A lot of great functions there, ladies and gentlemen. Make sure you take advantage of all of them. Let's get back to the, uh, to the commentary. Keep tweeting us, hashtag C24Live. We love to hear from you. Ask us anything about mainly about Lawrence Trent's life, but if you have other questions, they're also welcome. Also, send us anything you like about Jan. <laughs> Hashtag C24 Live. Absolutely. Uh,
Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Vanessa. And uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks to everyone who's going to watch this game, watching right now. Um, hmm. I don't see the live chat yet, YouTube, or I guess. Okay, was it? Uh, okay. Yeah, anyway, uh, people are watching. Hi, Balas Arato. So we'll take a look at some of my interesting games. I'm not really sure which one to pick. Um, I have three right here. Hello uh, to YouTube and to Chess24. Yeah, I have three right here. So I selected three games. First game was the game where I played Ivanchuk in 2009. Second game, I believe, is one of my best games, which is against Ding Liren, 2015. And third game I have is uh, the game where I beat Magnus Carlsen, the only game I ever did in 2018. So which one do you guys want to see? Yeah, hello again, everyone. Hi. Um, so I guess let's start with the Ivancho game. Uh, this game <clears throat> was the second round of the FIDE World Cup in 2009. And this was the first game, and I had the black pieces. You want Liren or against Ivanchuk? Ivanchuk? Okay, Ivanchuk sounds good. And this was the game where he almost retired from professional chess, but he later retracted. But he played e4, and I played e6 for basically the third time in my life. d4, d5. Yeah, against Ivanchuk, it's not really easy to say what opening he's going to go for because he plays every opening. And for this game, I was actually expecting d4, but he played e4 anyway, and he blitzed this moves out. And he played knight c3. And here I played bishop b4, the winner were French. And it's the first time I ever played this line. I prepared this match for Gusenov, but uh, in the first round, but he didn't play knight c3. So after bishop b4, the winner is uh, an opening that's uh, uncompromising, but it has been recommended by Anish Giri in his recent French course. So it can't be that bad. Yeah. Um, basically, Black's idea is to give up the bishop pair in, in return for weakening white queenside pawns on c3 and d4. But... Uh, but the pawn on g7 is vulnerable and black has black is behind in space. But for this game, Ivanchuk quickly played e takes d5, uh, surprising me because he didn't even think before playing this move. But after e takes d5, I don't think uh, this line is very, very scary for black. And after bishop d3, I guess he just wanted to get a game where he can outplay me because uh, he, my rating was only 2640 back then. and I was only 16, so I, I bet he was trying to play an equal game and try to outplay me. Yeah, congrats for the win in Champions League. Oh, yeah, thank you, the Champions Chess Store. By the way, if any of you have any questions during the game, just feel free to type in chat. I won't be using chess engines during my analysis because I don't see the point of doing that. So we'll try to look at it from human perspective. I play knight f6, black has other moves. But anyway, let's just take a look at the game. Castle, uh, white castles short. Magnus Carlsen has tried this with the white pieces where he won a good game against Papa Vallejo um, here. And here I played the move uh, bishop g4 to activate the light squared bishop, put pressure on the e2 knight. And uh, white understandably get rid of the pin. And after bishop h5, my idea is just to trade my light squared bishop with bishop g6 because this bishop on d3 is very active. So again, if you have guys have any questions, is e takes d5 very drawish? Yeah, I would say e takes d5 is quite drawish, yeah. If black plays the French defense to win, e takes d5 can be a very frustrating uh, encounter. But uh, at the same time, it's similar to the exchange slav because after e takes d5, there are no fourth draws. There are no concrete fourth draws, like let's say the poison pawn 
of the Nadar for their first fourth draws. In the exchange French, there are no fourth draws. So you get a symmetrical pawn structure, but at the same time, uh, all the pieces are still on the board. So there's room for outplay. Um, 2640 only went 16. Yeah, 2640 and 16. Yeah, I believe uh, when I was 16, I reached a peak of uh, 2672. So that was my peak at 16. But um, <clears throat> Bishop G6. Yeah, so white was threatening to grab the bishop pair. And uh, yeah, he can grab the bishop pair now. But I thought that with my pawn on G6, my king side is more stable than with the pawn on h7. Because here at least the pawn on g6 protects the f5 square. And black, white can play f4, but in return he will weaken the e4 pawn. Cast in background, you can show it. Oh, well, he's sleeping right now. He's taking a nap, uh, as he always does. So Ivanchuk played bishop g5 first because he doesn't want to play f4 as after, I don't know, let's say takes takes, no, let's say knight e4. <clears throat> the position gets uh, complex. Um, yeah, or alternatively f4, probably c5 is stronger. But anyway, uh, bishop g5. Um, yeah, do you remember all the moves without seeing the notation 11 years later? High crunchy move. Uh, actually, I don't because I played lots and lots of chess games. So I can probably remember the ideas and not specific moves. Yeah, hi again to all the Filipinos watching this show. So Bishop G5 was played, putting pressure on the knight. I played C6. I don't know, F4. <clears throat> now Vasily wanted to play F5 and give checkmate. Vasily is an incredibly strong player and versatile player. And when he, he's in his form, he's unstoppable and he can beat anyone in the world. Uh, at the same time, he's uh, unstable in his play. So sometimes he's out of his game, but when he is in his game, he can beat anybody, including Magnus Carlsen or Gary Kasparov. Uh, but uh, not sure what Vasily Ivanchuk does now. Nowadays, um, wonder if he plays checkers still. Queen b6. Yeah, thank you, Dinoko and Echo. So queen b6 is an important move here because uh, white was threatening f5. And if you get this position, well, let's say rook takes f5, probably. White gets this unpleasant pin on this diagonal. And the knight on f6 is very important for the survival, survivability of black's position. And uh, yeah, strong pressure in the f file. This is bad. So I played queen b6. I thought this was a good move. Threatening counterplay on the d4 pawn. So I'm threatening to capture on d4 with check. Yeah, checkers I've heard. Yeah, I've shown a bunch of uh, any chance we can see some cats? Maybe a bit later because I just had my lunch and he's taking a nap right now and uh, quite hard to move when you have a blanket. And you... Oh, okay. So knight a4 is a very concrete move. So let's look at the ideas of queen b6. So this pawn is threatened with check. If white uh, defends it with knight e2, if white defends it with knight e2 defending the pawn with the idea of h f5, now black gets this new resource, knight h7. So this was the difference. I didn't have this move earlier as my knight was pinned, but knight h7 attacking this bishop. And here I believe the computer was suggesting weird moves like h4 to protect the bishop um, and threaten f5, but I didn't really believe in it. So if white wants to play f5, he has to retreat the bishop. But now after knight d7, um, f5 is met by g5, keeping the long diagonal close. And in this position, black is doing excellently because we have good control over the f6 square. 
he can move our knight. And this diagonal is closed. So this bishop on d3 is passive. And in addition, the pawn on g5 is defended. Black is doing well. Yeah, love you, Wesley. Thanks for doing this. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, we'll be doing this regularly the next few weeks, I guess. Or also the next month. And also, I'm not playing in Waikanze, so yeah, I'll be at home in January. But Vasily found this very nice move, knight a4. A move which forces the play. It's very concrete. Um, attacking the queen, intending c3. So now if you move the queen, then he just attacks with f5. And game over. So you have no choice, but you have to grab this pawn with check. No other moves. So let's see what happens. Uh, fortunately, it's check. But now white has many threats. C3 is a threat and uh, F5 is also a threat. And I assume that queen E3 is just, uh, yeah, queen E3 is just bad because uh, probably the move C3, attacking the bishop. And let's say the bishop moves somewhere. Then rook E1. And this queen has nowhere to go because the b6 and c5 squares are covered by the knight. And after queen f2, rook e2, the queen has no more retreat squares and black loses. So there is another fantastic defense here, a move which I don't think any one of us saw. Uh, bishop d2. And this is given by the computer. But the computer I used for analyzing this was probably like Ribka 4 or Ribka 3. Ribka 4 probably, so it's a very bad. I mean, it's a much weaker computer than what we have now. So Bishop D2. Bishop D2 is crazy. And uh, yeah, it's a computer move, attacking the knight. And yeah, after queen takes D2, um, black has knight E4. And uh, yeah, the idea is that the queen is attacked, the bishop is under pressure, and white cannot take on e4 because the queen is hanging. And uh, if he plays queen a5, then there's this concrete move b6 takes. Yeah, the white queen cannot defend the knight, and after takes, takes. Ah, black is equalizing in the end game. Or actually, I saw this. Did I see this in the game? I don't remember now. This game was played 11 years ago. So knight e4. But I played knight e4. Knight e4 is also a good move. And I remember I used a lot of time, a lot of time in this move as the lines become very concrete. And either it's either black is losing by force or he's holding. Wesley, why do you love chess? I love chess because it's a great game. I've been playing chess since I was seven. And, um, and chess is a fantastic game. It's just the most complex game ever created in the world. Uh, for example, I heard there are, what? 10,000 zillion times 10,000 zillion possibilities in the, entire, uh, in the entire game of chess. So it's like the... The possibilities in chess are endless and uh, I like thinking and uh, I like calculating for myself. I appreciate the beauty in the game. So that's one of the reasons why I dislike computers or AI in a way, because I believe they ruined the beauty of the game. But that's life and technology is something that uh, we should welcome in general. Um, so knight e4, threatening knight f2. Uh, white cannot take on e4 because, first of all, I can trade queens and escape for an endgame where I'm a pawn up. But queen takes e4 is also good. Uh, so now white has a choice. Knight f2 is a threat. Um, if he retreats with uh, bishop h4, this is a move that I haven't analyzed. But if he retreats with bishop h4 with the threat of c3, then black can reply, I guess with this move, bishop d2. And now this bishop on d2 is protected and black is a pawn up. 
and white cannot play c3 as this bishop is hanging and with the threat on the knight white cannot think about uh, starting any attack game go game go is harder no chess is much harder than go right yeah watch i don't really know much about go but i've seen the documentary uh with uh with the ai what's that called AlphaGo, yeah, AlphaGo, and I don't think uh, <clears throat> I think chess is much more complex than Go, but I don't know. I've never played Go really. So C3 attacking the queen and the bishop. Yeah, knight F2 is good. Check. White has to take because if he, he doesn't take, then there's this very famous smothered mate, knight F2. Um, so. Vasily takes, takes, and then he has to take the bishop. So now he has a pawn. No, no, he has he has given up a rook and a pawn in return for two powerful bishops. And it might seem like black is just lost because of the material imbalance. But it turns out after f6, this bishop on g4, on g5 is trapped. And, uh, and he cannot give the checkmate. Because if you play the logical move, bishop g6, then you try to give checkmate with queen h5, you think, oh, I'm going to mate him next move. But black has the saving resource, queen h4. And everything is protected. Black is up in material. Yeah, thank you. How old were you when you did 2500 in chess? Oh, yeah, good question. I was 13 when I reached 2500. So pretty good, pretty good. 2,500 at 13. And also with rating inflation. So you know, these days, 2,500 was harder back than 2007. I didn't reach the, I didn't get the grandmaster title until I was 14 because my rating was going up and down slowly. And uh, I didn't get the necessary required norms until I was 14. But I actually barely missed it. Now that you mention it, it's funny because in 2006, I had this very ridiculous game against Vladimir Belov in the PGMA Cup in Manila, in the Philippines. And I was only 12 back then. And if I won that last round game in a completely winning plus six game against Vladimir Belov, I would have gotten my <clears throat> first Grandmaster norm when I was 12. And so um, things would have been faster. But instead, I blundered and lost that completely winning game. Then I couldn't sleep for two weeks. And, uh, and it took me a while to get to finish my Grandmaster norms after that. So Vasily was playing for a win. And uh, he played Queen G4. And the idea to give checks. And also, now he wants to rescue the bishop with Bishop H4. So you cannot play Rook E8 with the idea of mate. Because after Bishop H4, the bishop directly guards uh, the e1 square. And basically, I spent a lot of time thinking in this position because if you took a quick look at the board, our king on, on black is weak, the light squares are weak. And in particular, this knight on b8 and rook on a8 are not joining the game. So the rooks are not connected. I cannot play rook a8 and I can't even move the knight. So I have to be very careful here. But fortunately, we're up in material after f takes g5. Used to cry after you lose in childhood. Yeah, it's chess is a very difficult game. And sometimes when you're focused on a game for a long time, um, yeah, crying is a normal part. Everyone cries one, once in a while. Yeah, Ibanchuk is such a great chess player. Yeah, no doubt. Ibanchuk is definitely uh, one of the greatest chess players who ever lived that didn't become a world champion. So Ivanchuk is extremely talented and uh, he's one of those peculiar, extremely strong chess players. Um, so he has, Ivanchuk has a great love of chess. His love for chess is probably uh, greater than Magnus and mine combined. So uh, that's why he's so good at the game. And even now that he's no longer a chess professional, I believe, um, he has this burning passion for chess, and I greatly admire that in him. And I believe back in the 90s, Ivanchuk was predicted to become a, a world champion 
but he never really got to i mean he's reached number two or number three in the world but i believe he didn't uh, really achieve as much as he could have because of his uh, extreme talent um yeah after fg5 uh let's see here now white has a choice you can take the pawn you can take this pawn but Ivanchuk found the strong queen e6 check, forcing the king to move. So the only square is h8. Our king has to hide on a dark square because white's control over the light square is just too strong. Apparently, everyone is a great player who you beat casually. <laughs> yeah, uh, king h8. And now the point is after queen h3, we have the block queen h4, blocking the h5. So I see, I don't even remember what Ivanchuk played in this position. So I have to look at the notes. So after king h8, um, if you take on g6, we have the reply queen h4. Always a very nice defensive move because we're protecting the h7 square. And at the same time, if, if he kicks our queen, we have this retreat square. And white can no longer gain time because we are also attacking the queen. Uh, well, meanwhile, if white takes, then now he's not threatening anything and we can develop our sleeping queen side pieces with knight d7, g3, and queen h3, and black wins. So actually black is barely hanging on here, but I don't see any win for white. So here after king h8, yeah, I remember now Ivanchuk played knight c5, which came as a surprise to me, but it's also good for a draw. I was mostly calculating rook f1, kicking the queen away. And so the queen has to move. We have to keep the h file close. And here there are many complex variations. Um, white has different tries. But in general, black is holding, for example, after g3, takes, takes. And now our king is safe. And uh, the line is concrete because white is winning the rook here on a8, it's trapped. But after queen c1, um, white, we're creating a counterattack on the bishop and white's king cannot hide from the checks. And we're gonna give keep checking forever, like check, check. The king runs here, queen d1 or check. And then here, yeah, and it's a draw. The computer was even giving the move knight d7, but I don't think that's, it's necessary to analyze that because no point analyzing computer lines. So knight c5 is a very tricky move by Vasily Ivanchuk because uh, as you can see, in order for your attack to succeed, you have to bring you, you have to bring forces into your forces closer to the attack. And here, as you can see, white only has a queen and bishop attacking the black king, and it's not enough to give checkmate. So that's why Vasily decides to, if he can bring this knight here then he would just win the game very easily. So actually here, uh, Black's defense is very difficult. I mean, have to find only moves. And I don't even know what I played here. I think I played queen takes somewhere. So let's see if people have any questions. My favorite opening, the Rui Lopez. Very good opening. Um, probably my second most favorite opening is the Sicilian Nidorf, just because it's very principled. Uh, not that I play it any good, but the Rui Lopez definitely one of my favorite open or my most favorite opening because in the Rui Lopez, you get everything. It's very principled. You first develop your knight and then you develop your bishop and then you castle quickly. Then you play rook e1 and then you occupy the center with d4. So it's a super principled opening and it's still doing well. So queen takes b2 is the only move here for black. And uh, yeah, the point of queen takes b2 is that um, the pawn, we get a pawn. Okay, not the most important thing, but the pawn is still a pawn. So now white sacrifices a further pawn. But on top of that, we are attacking his rook. So white cannot take on g6 because after queen takes a1, um, he's going to have problems with the back rank. And meanwhile, if white moves the rook, let's say anywhere, then uh, we can bring our queen back to the defense of the queen side with queen f6. 
attacking the queen, covering the g6 square. So queen takes b2 was the only move here, actually. So Vasily gave a check. I have to retreat, check. And now I have to go back to f8 because uh, if I play rook f7, white can just keep giving checks anyway and make a perpetual if he wants to. But I believe rook f7 is a bad move because white can, white probably has a win here somewhere, which I don't see at the moment. But in any case, I played king h8 because I was happy to um, draw against Vasily Vanchuk. First of all, I had the black pieces and I was never better in the game. And this was a two game mini match of, you know, from the World Cup format. So if you draw with black, then you're in a good standing because you can try to push with white or even if you draw with white in the next game, then you go to the tie breaks and it's not so bad. Okay, so I'm reading the chat. So yeah, I'm reading the Chess24 chat and the YouTube chat. So if you guys have any questions or move suggestions, but we're just doing a live analysis here without engines. Uh, Rook F1. Yeah, Vasily didn't avoid the perpetual check because why would you take a draw against a 16 year old? Doesn't make sense. Queen F6, check, King G8. But here he has to be careful because He's down an exchange. He has a bishop in return for this a8 rook. And in addition, we are black is two pawns up. And he cannot take on g5 if because queen f1 leads to back rank mate. So that's another move that he cannot play. And f5 doesn't threaten anything either because he cannot take on g6. Again, back rank mate. Um, and here is where Ivanchuk blundered and he ended up losing this game. Um, let's see the Magnus win next. Yeah, sure, we see the Magnus win next. I also have the Ding Liren, which is one of my most beautiful games. But yeah, let's see the Magnus game next. Uh, here, uh, Ivanchuk, he's done so much in material, but he kept playing for a win. So he played G3. This is a very surprising move um, because White is threatening f takes g5, but it's quite slow. And also he weakens his king's position in a little way. And here I found rook e8. Okay, I didn't even uh, remember this much of this game anymore because I thought I played knight a6 here. But rook e8, very good move. Because what it does is it covers the e6 square and uh, it removes our rook from, from the pin on the f file because white was threatening some knight e6 or fg5 followed by rook f8. But after rook e8, he can, if he just takes, then after queen takes g5, everything is protected. The square e6 is protected. And uh, yeah, and white is losing after knight e6, queen h5 because after the exchange of queens, White is just down too much in material and pawns. So after rook e8, I had uh, about 13 minutes at this point. I spent five minutes to find this move. And meanwhile, Ivanchuk only had a minute left on the clock. So here he was really in the panic mode because he probably missed rook e8 defending the e6 square. So he only had a minute on the clock and he was already uh, panicking. So he just grabbed the pawn. But see now our, our sacrifices have paid off because yeah, Ivanchuk realized that he has to get some material back. I guess f5 is possible here, but then starting fg6, but then we can just take and after bishop f5, uh, just queen h6 to block the mate. Anyway, uh, f5 should be losing to, he took the pawn, but after gf4, Rook f4, his king is also under attack. Now um, we get the powerful counterplay on the king. And queen e6. And here white is lost. Because if you trade queens, then he's behind in material. Well, if he plays uh, queen h4, then we can just uh, develop the knight, protecting the back rank and uh, sealing the win because white no longer has made threats. Uh, can you look at your game against Baruthan? Okay, yeah, I, I think my game with uh, 
the yeah the games I have here are better than that game with Verusan. So here Queen takes e6. Yeah, Vasily traded trades queens, but he only has a minute on the clock, and also he's got insufficient compensation after rook e7. Uh, with the idea to develop the knight, it's basically game over because if take knight d7. Yeah, so he played b5, but uh, he wants to prevent the development of my queenside pieces by taking control of the squares. But I figured what he was up to in just knight d7. And in this position, uh, we have a whole rook in return for the bishop. And in addition, this pass d pawn is going to start pushing. So it's game over, rook e8. Yeah, the thing is, whenever he pushes the pawn, I always have rook c8, eliminating his last chance. And now the king comes. In the end game, active king is the most important thing, or not, probably not the most important, but one of the most important things in the world. Check. The king comes to support this pass d pawn. Um, hmm. Okay, let's see. Uh, you guys have any questions? Yeah, thanks for watching. Yeah, and now he resigned because my king links up with the pawn and keeps an eye on his pawn. And after uh, king d4, uh, basically any move wins. Probably the simplest is rook b8. And with the king on d6, this c pawn can never get dangerous. And so we'll move on to the next game. This was my game against Vasily. The next game, uh, he, I played the exchange lab against him and I drew and eliminated him out of the World Cup. So that was it. Yeah, thank you. Hope you like the game. So should we look at Magnus game or the Ding Liren game? Or oh, GM Aryan, what was his mistake? His mistake basically in this game is... Uh, well, first of all, he could have repeated moves here and just taken the draw, but he started to become very ambitious. And then he played G3 with only one minute left on his clock. And after rook E8, uh, black's better. Ding, ding or Magnus? My win against Ding was more beautiful, but game against Magnus is a rarity because no, not many people a beaten Magnus in classical chess. But we should probably look at Magnus, yeah, just uh, in honor of uh, the champion's chess tour. Well, maybe we have time to... One... Yeah, we'll see. Maybe we have time to look at both. Uh, I'm not really in a rush. But yeah, let's try to do both, yeah, real quick. Okay, so we have to see the Magnus game, of course, yeah, because in honor of chess, um, yeah, so this game was played in 2015 in Ding, the game Ding Liren. Um, this was played in 2015. So Ding Liren was already clearly a very strong player. His rating at the time of the game was 2781. So clearly top five level strength. And uh, yeah, five years ago. And this also the last game that Ding Liren played the uh, King's Indian defense, basically. Because if you remember, if you look back five or seven years ago, Ding Liren used to play nothing but the King's Indian defense with black. So now he plays uh, Queen's Gambit, Semislav. But uh, back in those days, he plays nothing but King's Indian all his life. So King's Indian, I don't think many people remember the fact that Ding used to play exclusively the King's Indian defense in a high level. Nowadays, not many people do play the King's Indian. But uh, yeah, he played d6. He was clearly well prepared. And let's just go quickly. Uh, this is the main line of uh, the classical King's Indian defense, where white plays very logically, developing bishop on e2, knight on f3, and short castle. So it's the classical way of playing against the King's Indian, uh, not to play for any tricks or or anything like that in the opening, but just develop your pieces and castle. And um, 
thrust on the, on the strength of your center pawns. So knight c6, also the most ambitious move for black, d5, knight e7. And uh, here my favorite move back then and still is, is knight e1. And this is the classical main line because here white has many moves. There's the bayonet attack, a very fashionable move. Uh, I guess there's also knight d2 uh, amongst other things. Boris Gelfand played the very interesting bishop g5, I believe, provoking h6. And then if you play h6, then he retreats to d2, if I remember correctly. And now this pawn on h6 can be a target later on. So there are many lines, but I like knight e1. And what knight e1 does is two things. Now first, black is threatening knight h5. So with knight e1, we prevent knight h5. So that's the first thing. The second thing is it covers the g4 square. So in many lines, we're threatening to advance with g4 and gain space. Uh, the third thing is that it frees up the f3 square for the f pawn. So many lines we play f3 to defend the e4 square. And finally, the knight is very well placed after an eventual knight d3. Because on d3, the knight attacks the e5 square and the c5 square, protects the f4 square. So knight e1 is a general all-purpose move. And black has to play knight d7 because if he plays knight e8, then after bishop e3, the attack on the queen side is very powerful with c5. It's very fast. And, uh, and it's all about mating ideas here. In the Black will attack on the king side White will push on the queen side and try to get rid of this bishop on c8. But uh, yeah, I played this line a few times. So let's take a look. Bishop e3, this is my the line that I like playing. Bishop f2 and g5. So black doesn't, uh, black just wants to give checkmate for sure. And so we have to be careful with our king and uh, yeah. If you guys have any questions, just feel free. And here I played this line um, many times in my life. Uh, I played g4 against Ding Liren back in 2011. And I played g4 against Van Wely also. But those games went well, but later Black found the equality against g4. g4, the idea is to close the king side. Uh, but the other line is knight d3 followed by c5. And we go for this queen side attack. But I decided to play this line in rook c1. And the idea is to play c5 also. And the rook is useful on this square. But after knight g6, I played this c5 move right away, which is a pawn sacrifice. Yeah, thank you guys for watching. Um, yeah, c5. This looks so dangerous for black. Yeah, it is dangerous for both sides because. Black can lose on the queen side, but white can also get checkmated very quickly with g4, g3. Uh, but the good thing right now is that uh, with our with white's bishop on e2 and queen on d1, and we're indirectly protecting the g4 square. So we're trying to prevent black from giving checkmate as fast as possible. And in this position, I I could play knight d3. But then it would slow down my queen side attack. And then black plays some rook f7 and then h5, g4. And probably mate could come if white is not accurate. So I played c5 right away. I played this already before. Uh, the idea is it's a pawn sacrifice. If black takes with the pawn, then uh, the c file gets quickly opened after b4, possibly takes knight b5 and black cannot defend this pawn on c7. So the position opens up. Uh, so Ding Liren took the pawn because if he didn't take, then my attack's very fast. And now after b4, the point of the pawn sacrifice is that black cannot play knight d7. Also after knight b5, there's no way for him to defend the pawn. He's one, one tempo too slow. And so instead of knight d7, which is not playable, Black has to retreat to knight a6, and this has been played in several games. But after knight d3, uh, it turns out that black's knight on b on a6 is far away from where it should be. 
this knight should be on the king side, say on f6. But on a6, this knight extremely passive. It's not doing anything. Okay, it defends this square. But other than that, it becomes of a very defensive nature. And let's say black plays h5, with Ding, which Ding Liren did. And the difference now is that without a knight on f6, when black plays g4, we can actually just take twice. Takes, takes. And then black has no attack and, uh, and his bishop on g7 is very poor. So that's the difference. h5 now, g4 is much harder to implement. So that's the whole point of the pawn sacrifice. I played knight b5. Um, I had prepared this variation uh, for the tournament. So I was happy to see it happen. So here I'm threatening to take this pawn on a7 because my bishop is very long range. And when black plays b6, uh, I'm, actually, I'm also happy because it weakens the c6 square. It weakens its light squares. And here white has several moves. I guess you can play rook c4. You have several plans now. One plan is to play rook c4 with the idea to triple on the c-file and pile in the pressure. A very logical plan. And especially given the fact that after g4, we can just take. But I played bishop e1 instead. And I'll explain the idea of this move. If this variation by King's Indian isn't used much at the top level, well, this is one variation. The other one is the knight f3 followed by h3 uh, variation. In general, no one plays uh, the King's Indian top level because uh, theoretically black is worse in many of the lines. For example, Fabiano plays h3 followed by bishop e3. There's also the Fianchetto system. So in general, white can play many testing lines against the king's Indian. And uh, the king's Indian is a very difficult opening to prepare with black because the computer is not of much use. And uh, black is slightly passive with the bishop on g7. And in general, if you play a second rate opening in the top level, your opponents will, will punish you. So you have to play solidly also if you don't want to lose too many points. Uh, from what I know, Ali Reza Firuzja and Taymor Rajabob are the only two top players who play the King's Indian from time to time. So Bishop D2. The idea of Bishop E1 is to, to protect the B4 pawn and uh, later to reroute our knight to F2. And from F2, uh, the knight guards the G4 square. So we're making it hard for black to advance. Ding played Bishop F6. Knight f2, okay, we, we made some maneuvers. Queen a4, putting pressure on the a6 knight. So black's main problem here is this knight on b8. He can't really go back to b8 and d7 because c7 is falling. So Ding played bishop d8 to protect the pawn. Now I played queen a3. And now I'm threatening to capture with knight takes d6. I had no idea it was dim dubious now. It's all Kasparov played, no? Yeah, Kasparov used to play this before, but that King's Indian is not his only opening, even when he was playing it in his prime, because he was also playing the Grunfeld defense. And the Grunfeld defense it is extremely good, theoretically, compared to the King's Indian. The King's Indian has a dubious nature because black gives up all the space on the center. And the bishop on g7 is quite passive in some lines. And uh, yeah, so the I believe the King's Indian is not nearly as strong as opening as the Grunfeld, especially nowadays. And uh, yeah, Kasper Bins Prime, he was playing King's Indian and Grunfeld. But later on, he switched to, to the Nimsu Indian and to the Slav defense. And he also played the Queen's Gambit accepted for a time. But yeah, Fisher played it in his era, but you must understand that it was a completely different era because without the computers, um, it's easier to play riskier openings. Now, English opening is not a dubious opening. English is a very good opening for uh, positional players. So 
Ding finally has had enough and he played g4 because he can't hang on to his queen side. I'm threatening knight takes pawn. And if he plays, so he has problems with knight. And if he plays knight b8, there's still knight takes pawn. And it's game over. And in this kind of pawns, in this kind of king side, king's Indian pawn structure, the bishop, the life squared bishop is the most important piece for black. Uh, in the entire opening. Because when you get a position like this, let's just say this will happen. If your bishop is on the light square, you can always sack on h3. But without the light squared bishop on the board, you, it's all like you could almost never checkmate white because you have no piece to sacrifice on h3. So that's why usually in this King's Indian pawn structure, once the light squared bishops are gone, it's basically game over for black. Uh, so Ding plays g4, time to attack. Now uh, he's taking advantage of the fact that if I take twice, uh, this knight on b5 is hanging. So that's the reason why he can play queen a3. What about the Alicain's defense? Well, the Alicain's defense is a very good opening for, for a surprise. But if you play it regularly, I don't think you will get that great of results. Well, depending on your opponent, of course, and depending on your level. But in general, if you only play the Alicain defense, then your opponents will start to become, will start to prepare against that opening and uh, probably not going to have the best time. In general, I consider the best opening against E4 to be the Berlin defense, the Ray Lopez or the Sicilian Nydorf. Well, against D4, I guess the best openings are the Grunfeld, the Nimso Indian, and the Queen's Gambit defense. Um, oh yeah, now the move that made this game very exciting, knight takes b4, because I'm threatening this knight, and if he retreats it, then I can capture this pawn freely, and well, with, a, with, with a nice position. So Ding played knight b4, very nice move, because he wants to sacrifice the knight for an attack, but he doesn't want to do it right away. He wants to grab a pawn, so basically, this knight is on a suicide mission and he takes a white pawn with him to the next life. Um, I have to take the knight. And f3. Ding's very aggressive uh, calculating player. So he's trying to give checkmate with a handful of pieces. For example, if I take, take, then the g file opens. Knight comes here and um, maybe white will end up getting mated after all. Uh, do you do tactics often? Yeah, I mean, if you're practicing for speed chess or for blitz or rapid, then tactics are the most important thing because the nature of the game changes so quickly. You have to be adept. Uh, okay, I'm also reading a chess 24 chat. Thank you all for watching. What is your take on the Sebastian Cobb Sicilian? The Sebastian Cobb Sicilian is a very good and solid opening with excellent uh, uh, theoretical, in excellent theoretical help. The problem is on move to bishop b5 is quite annoying. And uh, if you're playing the Seveshnikov exclusively for a win, white has several solid lines and drawish lines. But if you play the Seveshnikov solidly, then that's an excellent opening, five out of five. Yeah, queen e7 is threatening to take. Now the game becomes very forcing, rook h7. Uh, white is black is not threatening mate yet, but he just wants to move the rook and and pile up pressure on the h2 square. And uh, yeah, knight queen c4. For example, I don't think I can play knight d3 here because uh, it's rook h2 working. Maybe it's got knight h4. Hmm. Rook h2, take, take, I don't remember now, but probably black can play something like knight h4. And if you take, queen takes h4 and g3. It's a very dangerous position for white. So I have to look for counterplay because black is just going to double on the h5. So queen c4 is a nice move, exploiting the weakened square. Now queen c6 is a threat, attacking the rook and threatening queen e8 to trade queens. So Ding Liren, of course, sees it. He plays rook h8, very nice move. The idea to defend the, the, the back rank uh, in preparation for a possible queen e8. So here I'm threatening to exchange queens. Ding plays queen h7. 
Because if he trades queens, then it's game over as he's a piece down. So he's threatening mate. I cannot play h4 because he'll just sacrifice a piece. So I have to play h3. But this move is very nice because whenever black takes, then just king h2. And this h pawn is actually a shield which protects us from mate along the h file. Uh, so rook b8, I was planning to, to take his rook. Knight cd1, bring a knight closer to the defense on e3, and also exerting extra pressure on c7. And here Ding made a blunder, uh, but not an obvious blunder at that. He played a6, but the right move for black was very hard to see. I believe the right move was some crazy. Yeah, the right move is, I don't think anyone uh, in the world would find, with limited time, of course. I don't think anyone would find knight f4 here, which is the crazy best move. I don't even know why it's the best move, but basically black is going for mate. And if you take, he takes, and he just, yeah. This knight f4 tactic, it can always be very annoying in the king's Indian. But a6, check. Who is the most natural talented player ever? Probably Capablanca, I would say. Natural, natural talent. Natural talent, probably Capablanca, probably Morphe. I don't, I don't know, hard to say. Uh, rook c7. Yeah, and this is why it's a blunder because after a6, Ding probably thought I have to retreat my bishop because it's attack, but he missed this check. And he probably thought check doesn't make sense because check, then I move my king and attack your queen. So a queen has to move, right? But he missed queen d8. Or maybe he didn't miss it. He just underestimated it. So the point is now we have a piece. And so after taking on d8, we have two pieces. And black took the queen and we took the pawn. So we have two pieces for the queen right now, but black uh, is in check. And if he moves the king, then we can capture. And we get this position where we have uh, two pieces in return for this rook. And uh, our pieces are well coordinated. And in general, in the end game, white is always, almost always favored in the king's Indian because we play the king's Indian to mate your opponent. So Ding played bishop d7, but after takes uh, and king h2. Uh, let's, uh, let's take a look at the position now. My king is very safe. I'm not going to get checkmated. And he has a queen, but in return, we have two bishops. Two bishops are extremely strong in an open position, especially with no other, no competition on the board. So in turn for the queen, we have two bishops and a knight. And our minor pieces, if they're coordinated, they're almost, they're almost always stronger than a queen. So three minor pieces, if they're coordinated and protecting each other and well-placed, like here, my bishop has outpost here. My knight has an outpost on f5. So three pieces are usually too strong for the queen if they can coordinate themselves, which they are working very well right now. Here, actually, white is just completely winning. Uh, I didn't uh, find the fastest way to win, but what I played was good enough. So bishop e6, preparing knight e3. Yeah. Sultan Khan, most natural up there. Uh, yeah, knight f4. Knight f4 actually makes sense. The evaluation after, after this move, uh, knight f4 was I think 0 0.00 if you let it be if let if you let it run deeply or if you use a supercomputer. I think the assessment is 0 0.00 zero and the white uh, finds a draw here somewhere. Yeah takes queen h4 threatening mate. Yeah I'll just show you the main line of the computer. Yeah, so basically <clears throat> black sacrificed two pieces and now he's threatening checkmate. But white has this Hail Mary save with check, sacrificing the queen and now there's no mate. And I believe the computer was giving, assessing this position as close to equal or slightly better for white. 
but uh, yeah, crazy stuff. But here White is just winning. And uh, yeah, Ding Liren tried to fight, but uh, but three passers with outposts and with targets is just irresistible. Here, and in addition, Black has no attack anymore. My king is uh, well protected for the time being because I got rooks and knights. Computer always say zero, zero. Yeah, that's the problem with computers, yeah, zero, zero. And the thing is when a computer says zero, zero, there are general some general guidelines where you can look as a human and say that uh, a position is easier to play or positions better. This game was bonkers, like can go south real fast. Yeah, the King's Indian, bad things can happen. So I'll just show this game quickly. Um, so as you can see, look at my pieces. They're like extremely well placed and protected. The knights are guarding each other. The knight is guarding the bishop. This bishop on f5. And black king can hardly move. This, this lady right here can barely do anything. And here I took on d7, eliminating his last piece. Um, it's also good enough for a win. Takes rook f7. And now rook f5. Mm, I guess if we play queen g6, uh, what do I have here? Some bishop. Bishop f8, probably. Targeting uh, this pawn on d6. And yeah, it should be game over. In the game, Ding, Tung, Ding Liren took on f5. And now he takes f5. And this pass pawn is basically unstoppable because it's well supported by our three pieces here. And black has a queenside pawn majority, but they will take forever to advance. It takes one, two, three, four, five. It takes around five or six moves to, to generate any counterplay. And meanwhile, we just push on f6. For example, let's say black played b5. Probably there's the move bishop f8. Let's say black plays b4. We take this pawn. a5, we take. And now this bishop is controlling the long diagonal. And so black is way too slow. So bishop f8 is a threat. And Ding Liren saw that. So he played queen f7. But now after f6, oh, okay, bishop g5. I thought f6 was also playable. But after bishop g5 and knight h6, game over because queen g7, f6. And if you take, there's the knight fork. Yeah. Well, here, f7. Do you like chess variants? Yeah, I like chess variants. I play them from time to time, um, mostly for online practice. I like uh, bug house and... Uh, I used to like crazy house, but problem with crazy house, there's too many theory. Yeah, anyway, let's just finish this game real quick. So knight, these three pieces are supporting each other. And now f7 and bishop e7 comes. And uh, yeah, because uh, black is way behind in material. And here f7, bishop e7, this trial here are very nice protecting everybody and uh, also threatening bishop e7. So Ding tried one last Hail Mary play with e3, but it didn't work because he's just too slow. And so now whatever black does, he's lost. Because if he takes on f7, then I capture the queen. And if he plays e2, with the threat of e1, and it seems like he's gonna win, he's gonna get a, a new queen, we have this check. Black takes a knight. It's okay. We're still two pieces up. We have this knight f3. Black takes. And uh, we're only a piece up, but it's enough to win. Because, for example, black spawns are too slow. Push, king, push, king, push, king takes. B3 takes. A3, knight d4, A2, knight c2. And protect the passer, but just in time. It was a nice variation, actually. 
uh, yeah, white is just in time. Um, yeah, I guess knight d4 is the only, 8x bit, oh, a3 also wins. So we don't, we don't win just by that move. a3 was also winning. So bishop e7, ding tried e2, uh, but uh, I guess bishop takes f8 is fine. But knight h4 is even stronger because we force black to retreat here. Because if he takes, then we are captured with check. Ding played here, queen. But after bishop takes d6, this pawn is protected and we're threatening to promote. And so Ding gave checks, checks. But after king g4, black has no perpetual check because if he checks here, then we cover with knight f3. So black has no perpetual check because next comes the umbrella, bishop f4. And if you check here, then we can cover this way. Well, if he checks here, we can cover this way. And finally, Ding Lear and resigned because this pawn is going to promote. Yeah, we'll take a look at the last game now against Magnus. I hope you like my game against Ding. Ding Lear, and that was also the last time he ever played the King Finian defense. Maybe that gave him the shivers. What's the best Spanish variation for Black? Because besides the Berlin Wall, uh, the best Spanish variation for Black is uh, the martial defense. It's never refuted, very solid. The martial defense, and then after that, probably this uh, bishop c5 system. What do you call that? The Moller or the Archangel's variation? And yeah. But I prefer the Marshall because in the Moller, you have to memorize a lot of theory. Um, so this game was played in 2018 against uh, against Magnus. So this was played in Norway chess um, two years ago or two and a half. Anyway, Magnus was leading the tournament. This was back then when Norway was hosting regular point tournament with none of that uh, Armageddon stuff going on. So Magnus was leading by a point. Yeah, he was leading by one point. And so Hikaru Nakamura was interviewed uh, before this game, previously, the previous day. And then they asked him, Hikaru, how can Magnus be caught now? He's leading by one point and he seems to be strolling. Well, Hikaru said that someone just had to beat him. And, very, and it happened very so the next day. That was nice prediction by Hikaru. Uh, well, they probably didn't think that it was going to be me. Um, but anyway, I played d4. Um, I was expecting Magnus to play the Queen's Gambit or the Nimso Indian defense. And here Magnus uh, was playing bishop b4 uh, back in those days. Or, I mean, he still plays it, but these days he more often plays the semi-slav. But I was expecting bishop b4 or bishop e7. But he surprised me by playing the Slav. Right now, the Slav is, has become very popular in high level chess. But back then, it's only Magnus who was playing the Slav. Yeah, probably. He yeah, played the Slav. And uh, the Slav is a very solid opening. But uh, I don't know. It's also uh, a solid, but a bit passive because. Compared to the Grunfeld uh, here, in many lines, Black is ready to create counterplay with c5. And in the Queen's Gambit and in the Nimso, also in many lines, Black is ready to create counterplay with the move c7, c5. And so the Slav is a bit passive because you push the pawn here to support this pawn. But then for a long time, you're not able to create counterplay in the center with c5. So yeah. So that's why I don't play the Slav, although many people do. Okay, guys, Magnus is the new, the barrier in the side itself. Uh, okay, that's true. In the Marshall, White can force the draw. Um, 
Yeah, that's true. But generally, in generally in the Marshall, the draw is not so obvious and unless your opponent memorizes it concretely move by move. And the, the problem with Brayer is it's solid, but at the same time you give white the center and he can close the position with d5. And it's very difficult to win. And the side said white can also force a draw there with this knight g5, knight f3 stuff. And so I guess if you want to play for a win against uh, one e4, uh, the Sicilian would be a better choice. Let's say the Nidorf or the Taimanov. Um, yeah, e4, e5, it can be quite difficult if you really want to go for the win. Perhaps the French win aware is also an option if you absolutely have to go for the win. But if you play like e4, e5, white has a number of ways to try to draw. For example, bishop c4 is one. And then there's this d4 or knight g5. And white also has this annoying system, which is d4 takes, takes, knight f6 takes, takes, bishop d3. In general, it's very difficult for black to play for a win here. Uh, for example, d5, white can take or play queen e2. But yeah, there's this queen e2 and knight c3. It's also very drawish. And uh, yeah, so if you absolutely have to play for win with black, I don't, I'm not sure e4, e5 is the best way to go. A d4, d5, c4, c6. Oh, yeah, so in this position, I took on d5 because uh, I was preparing the exchange lab for a previous tournament in the candidates and did some work on the exchange lab. It's not the most ambitious. Or no, I take that back. Now, the exchange lab is actually a pretty ambitious way to combat the slav because uh, after take take the position looks symmetrical and equal but you have all these pieces on the board and you have an extra tempo so you can play nice c3 and you can try to outplay your opponent you know by occupying the c file and the such the sicilian dragon the Sicilian Dragon, probably a good opening, but in general, it's very forcing. It's very concrete. And if your opponent is well prepared and he knows the lines in the Yugoslav attack, then uh, it's hard to get a fighting, a fighting position. But of course, it's very playable. It's just very concrete. And in many lines, you have to find only moves for, with black. So I played bishop f4 and knight f6, e3, knight c6. And I played knight f3 because this is the line I studied. Uh, white can also play e3 first in order to the delay the development of the knight. So in some cases, you can develop the knight on e2, uh, for example. Uh, but uh, uh, there are some move order issues here. Also. Of course, there's advantages for knight f3 or e3. The difference is that after e3, black has this option, bishop g4, which I believe is his main option. While here after knight f3, bishop g4 is not possible because after knight e5 and takes, black loses this pawn. So Magnus played a6. The main line was bishop f5. But anyway, rook c1. I'm not sure what Magnus was thinking here. Maybe he thought I was playing for a draw or stuff like that. But as I said, the exchange love is not exactly the most drawish opening because uh, there are so many pieces which you can uh, try to play your opponent. E3, yeah, rook c8. Again, there are some issues here with e6 because after queen b3, black has to be careful. These two pairs are weak and uh, the bishop can no longer retreat to d7. So for example, after knight a5, queen a4 check, black cannot uh, retreat his bishop and he's got some problems on this uh, diagonal. For instance, after knight c6, knight e5, and some problems here. So that's why I played e3 first. Uh, because if you play queen b3 here, then black has bishop d7. I assume. I'm not a big expert on the slav defense, but uh, I know some ideas. So Magnus plays rook c8 first. So now if queen b3, 
he can still retreat the bishop and defend his problems along this diagonal. So rook c8, of course, there's some theory here. But I played bishop e2, more flexible move, e6, and uh, yeah, castle. Now he played knight d7. Uh, you'd think that black wants to move his uh, bishop first, but the problem is if he moves the bishop, uh, again, there's some theory with queen b3. Queen a4. And again, black has problems with this diagonal uh, because if b5, knight takes b5, wins four white. The rook is protected and black takes a while to castle. What depth do you typically let the computer reach when you analyze your openings, Wesley? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, like for example, chess bomb depth is very bad. That's why, for example, it's ridiculous to look at comments and chess bomb and say, oh, he means this, he means that, he should play this, should play that. But actually, chess bomb engines are very weak because they analyze only up to like depth 22 or depth 23. But generally, you should let, uh, or at least, in top level, you should let the engine run up to like depth 40 or, or more. So yeah, chest bomb engines, very weak engines. I can probably beat them. Anyway, knight d7. Magnus played this quite fast. Oh no, I'm just kidding. I can't beat the chest bomb engine, but still. Um, yeah, so knight d7, multi-purpose move to cover this square and to protect the e5 square. So now queen b3 loses its bite because this knight is blockading the diagonal. Uh, but I played knight a4 with the idea to take control of the c5 square. And whenever he plays b5, I'm ready to meet it with knight c5, takes, takes, and we get a protected pass pawn on, on d4, which can be supported with knight d4 and also ideas of a4. Even just 24 engines are weak. Yeah, yeah, probably uh, because uh, they're just, uh, yeah, depends on browser, on the browser, I guess. Or, but yeah, they don't go asleep. Do you have any techniques or software you use to help memorize your openings? Well, I use, uh, what, chess base, I guess. And then, uh, you just repeat and repeat your lines and don't, the secret is don't go through them fast. Uh, for example, when I'm working on openings, I tend to use like the touchpad of a, of a laptop in the tournament instead of a mouse. Because if you're using a gaming mouse, then you just go so quickly like this, you're, you make a move, you make, you, make like, you make like 50 moves a minute, and then it's very hard to memorize the lines. So generally, I try to prefer when I'm studying openings or reviewing, I use like the touchpad of the laptop. So that way I'm moving it specifically, I'm moving slow and I'm able to memorize things better. But when you use like a fast mouse, you can make many moves, but then you get to the board and you find out you can't remember anything. But of course, memory is an advantage in, in chess, a big advantage nowadays, uh, especially. Because in the old days, Players memorize a lot less lines in the opening than nowadays. So nowadays it's very, very memory oriented. And uh, yeah, I got to thank uh, um, the chess engines for that. Okay, so I played h3. Yeah, I want to go back here. The reason I played h3, which is not easy to understand, but the reason I played h3 is black was actually threatening to create a kamikaze attack here with g5. Well, not exactly kamikaze attack because uh, it's actually a very strong attack, attacking the bishop. Bishop retreats, push, and he makes use of the fact that his rook is still on h8, threatening to trap the poor bishop. h3, he pushes, opens the h file, and, uh, and white is in trouble. So actually, bishop e7, super sneaky move. Because if you're not careful, he's gonna push g5, h5. So I played h3 first. So now if black plays g5 and then h5, if g4 is okay, we just take. The most important factor is the h file is closed. But if he plays h5, then after knight d2, uh, he loses a pawn. 
H3, okay, any guys have any questions? Many of these opening questions, I think also really depend on the personal preference and playing styles of the player. For instance, I'll be bored to death playing the name score Queen's Gambit or E4, E5, but I like to be as dynamic as possible and play to my strengths. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But also, yeah, that's true. Uh, per opening choice is very personal and very subjective. Of course, in the top level, there are more correct openings than, I mean, there's the correct openings and the incorrect ones. Uh, but uh, but on the lower level, definitely opening is a very preference choice oriented. Uh, for example, like the Karokan and the French are very popular in, in lower level, but in the higher level, E5 and C5 are the most but of course, a matter of personal preference. And that's why you play chess anyway, to have fun. So you should never play an opening where you're not having fun. Also, you can base it on your results. Anyway, going back to the game, A3, threatening B4. So now uh, what black is slightly worse. And the reason is that he's slightly worse is because even with the symmetrical position, my knight is slightly more active on A4 while his knight on d7 is slightly more passive. So that's the only difference in the position, but white is slightly better here because b4 is a threat, knight c5 is a threat. And uh, if he plays knight b6, knight c5 comes. If he takes, we grab the bishop pair. And then we have some pressure along the c file. And that's what the exchange slab is basically about. It's an accumulation of small advantages uh, the only difference in this position are these knights, but turns out to be a pretty significant difference. Uh, Magnus played knight a5, an active move because he wants to create counterplay with b5. He can't go b5. I mean, he can go b5, but I'll play here. He takes, and then I take, and he can play this position, but this pawn on c5 is annoying because it's protected. And at the same time, it can be supported with the move b4. So this position is playable for black, but b4 is coming. And if I get b4, this pawn on c5 is going to be a protected pass pawn and black has limited play. For example, if he plays bishop f6, then threatening this pawn, then probably knight b4 here is a good response. Blocking this diagonal, attacking this knight, attacking this bishop, and uh, if black takes, I don't know, if he takes with the knight, then e takes. His pawn is well supported. It's advanced on the sixth rank. So black has some, some, some problems uh, with lack of space. And it's just, a, it's just a, not a big advantage for white, but it's definitely an advantage. And if he plays knight a5, then again, there's some b4. Yeah. Audio come from the left. Yeah, the microphone's right here. Um, don't exactly want to play in the middle because it's blocking the screen, but I'll play closer. Knight a4. Uh, so I played knight a5 with the idea of knight c4. Uh, but uh, yeah, now the move knight c5 is a strong one because uh, Magnus played knight c4, but if he takes and takes, uh, b4 is a threat and he cannot capture here because he loses a piece. Let's see, what day is today? Today is Monday, yeah? Okay, yeah, so no title Tuesday today. Anyway, just checking. Knight c4, favorite time format. My favorite time format is rapid, 25 plus, uh, 25 plus 10. Yeah, that's my favorite time format. Or alternatively, 90 plus 30 is also good, but that's classical chess. But I like 90 plus 30 play to finish because uh, it doesn't take forever to end, and I think uh, it's good enough. But my the time format I hate the most are bullet chess, which doesn't make sense to me, and also uh, eight hour or nine hour games. Like the old why can say time format where each player gets uh, two hours for the first 40 moves with increment of 30 seconds first move. And then after 40 moves, you get an hour, and then after 60 moves, you get half an hour. And then the game goes on and on. Knight c4 was played. 
aiming for counterplay. If I take on b7, he plays queen b6, and he has counterplay here. If I played b4, b4 is a very good move because it supports the outpost on c5. And uh, if black plays b6, I believe b6 is a tactical mistake here because we have this tactic knight b7. So b6 doesn't, doesn't make... Nine, no, I like time control 90, just 90 plus 30 without the 40 addition. I mean, it's not up to me to decide the time control, but I prefer just 90 plus 30. So queen e8. Yeah, b6 doesn't work because of knight b7 attacking the queen. Now this diagonal is covered. Play queen e8, takes, and no matter how black recaptures with the rook or with the pawn, then I have this knight d6 trick, forking, forking everybody, the entire family. Oh, well, not the king, but yeah, bishop takes, and the rook is trapped. So that's why b6 is not an option for black. And he has an issue here because this knight on c5 is very strong, and I'm threatening this pawn. So Magnus took, but after the nice move d takes c5, I have this, uh, I have this protected pawn here. I'm threatening to eliminate his knight, and he took the pawn, which was a small inaccuracy. Uh, stronger was uh, what was stronger here? Stronger was uh, b5. Yeah, b5 is given by the engines, but Magnus took on a3. It seems like a logical move because uh, he wins a pawn. And in addition, after knight d4, attacking his bishop, he just retreats. Okay, our bishop e4 first, but bishop g6 is also fine. But Magnus probably thought his position is okay here because after queen b3, the knight retreats to c4, and then I recapture the knight to regain my sacrifice pawn. And it seems at first glance that black is doing fine because material is equal and he has the bishop there. So it seems like no problems for black. But on closer inspection, it turns out that black has some problems because uh, of the pressure along the D file. That's one. Secondly, our pieces are much more active than blacks. Knight on D4 is very active, queen on C4. The pawn on c5 is well supported and it takes control of these squares. In addition, we're threatening rook fd1 to pile pressure along the d file when the black queen has to move to e8 and it's a passive square. And finally, this bishop on g6 is well placed, but it's actually not doing anything contributing to the game because uh, he doesn't have any active opportunities. He cannot play f6. And in addition, later after e4, this bishop, just imagine with the pawn on e4, this bishop will be will be caged in on g6. So in fact, black is clearly worse here. Okay. What do you recommend against Petrov here in a chessable course? I'm not sure I can say it now, yeah, but I'm definitely finishing up the course. It should be out in no time. Um, so queen e8, rook... Uh, yeah, queen e8. Mm, 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 mm. Um, okay. What do you recommend? Okay. Your dark squared bishop here is great. Yeah, my dark squared bishop is a very good piece because whenever he plays bishop f6, I get bishop d6. And uh, yeah. And so here I played bishop g3, and it seems like a weird move. Why would you ever retreat your bishop? But the problem is after rook fd1, Magnus actually has a, a trick here, which he, what he was planning for. He has e5 and takes. And then he simplifies the position thanks to this tactic. The ideal age to start to learn chess. Uh, well, if you're just playing chess for fun, you can start at any age at all. Any age at all, 60s, 50s, 40s, 30s. It doesn't really matter if you... If you just want to enjoy the game, it's a casual. But if you want to become a grandmaster and do all that hard work, then the ideal age to start to learn chess is as early as six or seven. Let's see, Beth Harmon learned the <laughs> learn chess at nine, right? Yeah, Beth Harmon. 
Okay, bishop. So that's why I play bishop g3 because black was threatening e5. What books could you recommend? Uh, I recommended uh, some books from my last Banter Blitz uh, series. So you can look it up there. But also I'll have a question answer tomorrow. Maybe I could think of more interesting books to say. But generally there are a lot of good books out there. Um, there are too many choices. Um, I haven't really read any beginner chess books uh, in the last in the last 15 years or so. So I don't know. <laughs> Maybe there are new ones, we'll see. So Magnus played e5 anyway, hoping again for takes, takes. But anyway, I'm probably going too slow with my analysis. So anyway, I'll just speed up. So I played knight b3. This knight was forced out, but we're routing our knight to a5. And in addition, black cannot play f6, which he would love to do because of the pin on his king. But if he can play f6 and bishop f7, then he can activate this bishop on g6 and he can solve his problems. So again, black's main problem here is if bishop is passive on g6 and uh, the pawn on c5 and the knight put exert strong pressure on black's queen side. And in addition, this pawn is hanging. Uh, so Magnus played uh, bishop d8, but this is actually a blunder because after queen d5, uh, he loses one of his pawns. So Magnus played queen b5. Uh, what did he miss here? Okay, anyway, he played queen b5. Ah, yes, after queen b5, Magnus thought he had queen b5 attacking the b4 pawn. And here he thought he could take. But it turns out that if he takes, then he loses the game very quickly. I don't think it is spamming to ask the same question whether in comment in the games. And what question? What do I recommend for improving technical play? Uh, if you're trying to improve technical play, maybe a book about, I uh, know, uh, Kramnik youth, Kramnik read the best games of Ro Jose Raul Capablanca and that helped him a lot in his childhood. So I would say a book about Capablanca's games or a best games book about Vladimir Kramnik or Anatoly Karpov should do very nicely. Uh, yeah, for instance, one of my favorite books is a game collection of Gary Kasparov that he has written himself. I can't seem to find that book online, but uh, I have it here. So this book is uh, one of my most favorite books ever. It's a very rarely seen book, but it's called Gary Kasparov New World Chess Champion. So this major book, this book covers every game played in the championship, supported by detailed and penetrating commentary and annotations by Gary Kasparov himself. Um, this book is about the 19, what year did Gary become world champion? 1985. It was about his 1985 World Championship match with Anatoly Karpov, and uh, it covered the entire 24 games. And Gary Kasparov annotated it himself. And I analyzed and worked on this book every single game. So this is a great book, but a very rare book. Uh, not sure why. But yeah, Gary Kasparov, New World Chess Champion. That was a great book. Uh, written by Gary himself because uh, because uh, Gary Kasparov came from the Botvinnik chess school and Botvinnik believed that uh, you should analyze your games deeply after a serious tournament. So you analyze your games and then you get to know yourself and then you publish your analysis. And that's uh, an idea by Mikhail Botvinnik, one of the greatest chess players who ever lived, by the way. Um, yeah, I'm not sure where Botvinnik finish in the top 50 of uh, of Peter Hein Nielsen. Anyway, yeah, so that's what Magnus missed after queen before bishop d6, threatening the rook. And rook e8, he missed that after c6, threatening his queen. He missed that after takes, takes, uh, that uh, his rook is pinned and he loses. What was the name of that book? Yeah, it's, okay, it's not just this book, but yeah, Gary Kasparov, New World Chess Champion, written in 
19. And what is written? Pergamon Press, written in 1986. First edition, a very rare book. But if you can get your hands on this book, it's uh, and go through the games, you'll learn a lot for sure because the games are were annotated by Gary himself. And yeah, Bishop E7. Yeah, I also like games annotated by top chess players themselves, like uh, uh, like on Mega Database, for example, the games that are annotated by Magnus, by Fabiano, those games are really a treasure. So I've also written a lot of annotations about my games myself. So actually, those annotations are are pretty pretty much a treasure because when a top player annotates their games by themselves and you look at those annotations, you actually learn quite a lot uh, because uh, you get to know what they're thinking and how their thought process works. So after bishop e7, Magnus' position has gone from bad to worse because now he's a pawn down and knight d4 comes and we snatch away that e5 pawn. So here Magnus' main job is to try not to, to try to hang on after bishop d6. Okay. Guy Kasparov, new world chess champion. Yeah, in general, the Great Predecessor series is also a very good book. But in that book, uh, the annotations are, the game annotations are pretty extreme. Tons and tons of annotations. So I'm not sure how good it is for studying because the variations are extreme. But those Great Predecessor books are definitely a must have for for your chess library. And I have a few of them. Um, yeah, black is a pawn down. And if he takes and C takes, followed by rook d1, he can, he can never win this pawn on d6. So bishop, but after e4, bishop very passive. And actually white should win this game smoothly, but I almost managed to throw away my advantage yeah, here now white's a pawn up. So the opening has been a clear success. Uh, let's see what the game, how the game went. Oh, thank you, crunchy move. Thank you. Prime guy or prime Magnus? Hmm. I don't know. I'd probably pick prime Gary because he's Gary. Uh, but uh, I don't know. Um, Gary was pretty extreme though in his prime because if you think about it, Gary reached 2850 back in 2000 or is it 1999? Like Gary probably reached 2850 in 2000 and that was 20 years ago. And so with rating inflation, everything 2850 is, uh, is a very extreme achievement back then. Well, Magnus right now, in his prime, he reached 2880, but that was in 2013. So Gary was definitely ahead in his time. Okay, G4, limiting the squares of bishop. F6, F4, advance the pawn, and we get an opposite colored bishop. But uh, with queens on the board, the aggressive side. Uh, is almost always favored by the opposite colored bishops because his bishop is not doing anything. Meanwhile, my bishop is blocking the D file and later we have targets to attack. Black spawns are all in dark squares. So H4, yeah, oh, Fisher 2785 from in 1972. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So probably if Fisher, the reason I don't give Fisher as the greatest chess player who ever lived is because he, he retired pretty early, so he on, he only had that uh, few years of really dominant chess. Meanwhile, Gary's been dominant for 25 years. But it's really a pity what happened to Fisher, because uh, a he could have gotten uh, very rich. I mean, he's rich, but he could have gotten much more successfully with commercials and contracts. But and b uh, he retired in his prime, so it was. Really a pity. But 2785, 1972 was extreme. But I believe that was also helped by the fact that he beat Bent Larsen and uh, Taimanov 
6060. So that definitely helped his rating a lot. Um, at what point was Fisher rich? Well, didn't he win like a million dollars in his, or was it? Didn't he win $2 million in his 1992 match with Boris Pasky? Yeah. In Yugoslavia, 92. And also in his 72 match, uh, didn't he win like, uh, how much was it? $400,000 or something? <clears throat> and also he had, he won some tournaments with, from the Piatigorsky Cup. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, Rook C2. Yeah, so basically I'm trying to give checkmate with G5 and black is trying to create counter to play in the A file with A5. So I played Rook C2. Are you going to write a book? In fact, I've written a book. Uh, yeah, I've written a book for, for, for Gambit Chess. Uh, you can look it up on Gambit. It's called uh, Desert Island Chess Puzzles. It's not really a book about, um, about my chess career. It's just a a book about puzzles from from my games in my career. So my greatest tournament is probably the oh yeah the Olympiad Chess Olympics in 2016. I think that's definitely the tournament I played the I played the best in. So Olympics 2016. Ah uh, yeah, and g5, and here I thought I was just gonna give checkmate because if it takes, 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 check, and then rook g2, and then takes, and you think like it's game over. But Magnus found bishop h5, a very nice tactic because the bishop is very sneaky here on f6. For instance, if you takes and takes, you're not actually not threatening mate. You have no checks because the bishop guards it all. And on h5, the bishop cannot be attacked. So look at this sneaky bishop. I mean, you can't attack him. Uh, you have no knights to attack him. So bishop h5, excellent defensive move. And with this move, Magnus almost saved the game. Okay, g6. Probably white has other wins. But I played g6, probably not the best move. But b5, a very important move to keep the a file close. Uh, because if you take, then rook takes, and rook a4 comes. And some counterplay. b5, very good move. And uh, yeah, I was able to win this game because this move uh, after rook b2, Magnus had little time. And uh, he played queen c6 because queen c6 was the 40th move. And this was back in the days when in Norway, when after you reach move 40, you get an hour on the clock. Yeah, you get an hour on the clock after you reach move 40. Uh, the last two Norways, they removed that rule. But uh, Magnus played queen c6 to get an hour on the clock. But queen d7 was actually much more accurate. Yeah, queen d7 is much more accurate because if I play queen d5 now, then he applies queen c6. And he attacks my queen. Meanwhile, after queen c6 and queen c8, queen d5, I, ga I gained the tempo uh, with playing, by playing rook p6, and now black cannot take queen c6. And now it's game over. So queen c6 was Magnus' final blunder. He could have defended more with queen d7. Uh, yeah. And then the position gets a bit complicated after queen c6 because black has counterplay on e5. And then the computer gives queen c8 attacking the rook. And if we take, queen takes, threatening check, king g8. And suddenly black is winning, turning the tables. But uh, yeah, in any case, uh, this move, queen c8 is quite difficult to find because uh, I think the idea is after rook g7, black has this crazy stuff, queen f5, check, and rook e6. 
So in any case, uh, Magnus' defense is very hard. Uh, the purse was 5 million in 92 and Bobby got two thirds. So two thirds of 5 million is how much? How much is two thirds of 5 million? 3.3 uh, 3, 3 or something. Okay, so he got more than 3 million. He got more than uh, $3 million yeah, for his win in 92, 3.33. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's a pity though, because uh, if, if Bobby didn't retire, and yeah, in 1972 also, Bobby Fischer won like $400,000 yeah, for, for beating, for beating uh, Boris Paskey, right? something like that. How much was the purse in 72? Yeah, to be fair, I don't, I, I don't think uh, Bobby, F Bobby Fisher retired because of uh, Ana because he's scared of Anatoly Karpov. No, I don't think Fisher was scared of anybody whatsoever. Bobby Fisher retired because uh, he's got mental issues, so he felt he wasn't the world was not appreciative of him enough, and uh, yeah, and he said I would never, I would never share a again, my beautiful games with the world. Because he was making all kinds of, uh, all kinds of demands that he feels that he deserves because he's the best chess player who ever lived. So he was making all these demands such as the demands were if the match is scored 10-10, no, if the match is scored 9-9 with first player to win 10 games, uh, to win the title. If the match is scored 9-9, then the match is finished. So I think that was the rule that him and Karpo were fighting about. He wants the match to be tied if the score is 9-9 and then to be played again the next time and the champion gives the title. But I don't think Fisher is scared of anything, uh, of anyone. I think if he was... He's more afraid of his uh, of his mother than of Anatoly Karpov. <clears throat> Queen c6. Yeah, here it's game over. Because after rook, rook b7, it's mate. Yeah, rook takes g7 is a mate threat. And after rook g8 and c6. I think Magnus uh, Magnus resigned here because after a3 and c7 and rook b8 comes and yeah it's also possible to play rook c7 followed by queen h6 <coughs> mm -mm. Yeah, so this game is the only game I ever won against Magnus in classical chess. Uh, but uh, yeah, in general, my results against him are far from desirable. So we'll see. Uh, 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 uh. Are you annoyed sometimes when your opponent doesn't resign in a completely lost position? Yeah, sometimes I do when they're, they're like down a queen or down two rooks or down you know, something. But they're, of course, they're in their perfect rights to, to not resign. Um, yeah. My favorite opening is the Rui Lopez. How long do I train daily? Uh, right now, I'm not. Well, I practice online chess, online dates regularly. But right now, I'm finishing my chessable course on one E4. So we'll get that done. And that course is extremely huge. That course is like extremely big. It's probably the biggest course that Chessable's ever had when it comes out. And my E4 course is a lifetime repertoire on, on white, on white's point of view. And so we'll be looking, we'll be looking at that. And since that course is extremely big, we cut it into two, into two sections. Yeah.
Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm I'm finished anyway showing the game. So So anyway, thank you to all you guys for watching and following, spending your afternoon here watching this live stream. Um, yeah, cheers and good luck and have a good day. Um, hmm. I'll, I'll have the question and answer again tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow morning, I believe it's like 10 a.m. Minnesota time or something. And uh, I'll see you. I'll see you guys again tomorrow. Probably gonna rest now because uh, still have to. I still have to do the video courses, and I need to uh, need the rest. So thank you very much, and uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you from Germany. Yeah, thank you, Chef Nix. Chef Nix. Yeah, thank yeah, thanks everyone. Good luck. Yeah, I'm I'm watching both chats. Yeah, I think now is a good time. <laughs>